Do you want to take questions? Or? Yes, please. Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about stories where there are rankings uh, and uh, you how, how those may be affected in certain circumstances. How do you vet um, studies and, and information that, that may have a lot of statistical information or that may have a whole lot of arcane stuff associated with it, regulatory language, all that kind of stuff? How do you vet that? How do you, how, how do you understand it? Um, and and in other words, in other words, how, how do you get to the point where you understand it, and then after that vet it? Because you can't vet it before you understand it. Um, I mean, how do how do you deal with that with that kind of stuff? Because a lot of the policy stuff can be very arcane. I guess I would I'll, I'll let Jonathan tackle that too. I, I guess I would say first of all, who's the source of the information? You know, if you're getting information from NIH or CDC or something like that. I think it's trust, you know, it's trustworthy information to begin with. So then it's just a matter of understanding it. It's not really a matter of vetting it. If a lot of studies and a lot of polls and a lot of reports and things that, uh, and, and this gets into politics as well, which party is, you know, and I try to avoid that as much as possible in this kind of a talk, um, often comes from interest groups and they're subjective. They're, they're interest groups, you know, you look at the name of the interest group and if it's Tea Party or if it's progressive, you know, you know, what they're trying, they're, the point they're trying to get across. So I think you want to know where their information is coming from. If they have charts and graphs, you look for the source lines, you look for where the original information came from. And frankly, we're in a business where we don't have a lot of time. If we think that it's a study or a poll or a report that is one-sided and um, is just saying what the group once said, we may ignore it. Um, or it certainly isn't going to show up on the front page. Um, so that's what I was saying. You know, we'll, for the most part, it's an interest group poll. We're not going to write it because it's, nobody's going to give an interest group poll that has a response that's not what the group represents. Uh, so we have a press release. Seventy percent of Americans disagree with what we're doing, so we're going to disagree. But for most of the good polls will come. Most of the good studies will come from the government or come from a respected organization. A lot of groups out there are very respected, uh, and and some of it will be. You'll get it because you need to know. And the people who are on the front lines have access to a lot of information and a lot of people that even that we don't have. Uh, when I worked down here for the Syracuse newspapers, and the, there was 35 Syracuse University students on the Pan Am Flight 103, the plane that was blown up by terrorists. And they met with the State Department, and they met with the White House, and they met with people that I only have a prayer of seeing on television. And then they told me everything. So I had access to all this information. So you're meeting, and, and you find out, especially you, you're finding out, somebody will give you this information. That's when you come to us also. Uh, you know about the study. The NIH is going to say, hey, we're, we're going to have a study out tomorrow. And you alert us, because the NIH may not put out a press release, so I might not be on their mailing list. And we'll get that study. And again, it goes back to when I talked about the regional reporting. Right, your group that wants uh, to place people with disabilities in job situations, and your state budget just cut it out, and you just cut all the money out, and you need a tax cut to somebody, and all of a sudden you're going to nothing, or you're going very little, or you want more money, and there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, we have uh, you you can, there's studies all over the place. Say, hey, I got some information for you, you know. They're cutting this, if you're a local guy, you're cu they're cutting this budget, and we're 70 foot out of 50 states in money already. Uh, and here's the study, here's the information, or there's a way to get it because we were told, if you called all the state labor departments, they have this information, you get it all online now. It's really easy you don't have to make phone calls. So tough information like that uh, to, to let us know. And then you get the story. Frankly, I discovered that you know, they're cutting the budget. Texas is a perfect example of Texas reporting. You heard from Rip Dunham earlier today, where they, you know, they have, they're, they're not going to fund health care, and they got the, the largest number of uninsured people already. So you're cutting the jobs program for people with disabilities, and they're already ranked 43rd. That's page one across the state, and those are the people you want to you want to influence. They they don't read. They're not, going to, they're, they're not going to watch the CBS Evening News. I don't even know who anchors it anymore. They might not even read USA Today, but they will read it. It's, it's in Kentucky and Mitch McConnell. They will read the Louisville Courier Journal. 
and they will call their lawmakers and complain. So that type, that type of information is very valuable. Kenny, did you have a question? Yeah. The, 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 the people, the, 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 the media, not only the news media, but, but, but uh, the, um, uh, uh, movies and TV shows, and we've seen a lot recently, people with disabilities and TV shows, such as Queen or other shows, and now there was a show that came out just last night called The World of Junk, which has a, which is interesting because I haven't seen it, well, second season, but I haven't seen it yet, but there was, there was a boy, you know, in his twenties, I think, but he and he gets a job and has a girlfriend and he has autism and and it's more a poster child, similar to Becky from Green Down syndrome. But you also see people on the extreme, like this one character, Sugar Mama, that came up with Asperger's, that which is lying about. And I'm, how do we address issues with the larger media and how does the larger media? portray disability and change public perceptions of disability. So, so do you mean like um, movies, movie, uh, TV shows, movies, movies and television, how do you affect the portrayal how of disability? How do disabilities? they change perceptions? Yikes, I think you need a different panel of people who, <laughs> who do that sort of stuff. I mean, obviously it's important. Um, you know, my feeling, again, going back to what I said earlier, is you're probably going to see, it, it, this is the nature of journalism, and it's also the nature of television and movies, is you're always going to see what's controversial, what's extreme, what's, you know, extreme, you know, when it comes to, say, a developmental disability like autism is going to be, you know, those that go to college and graduate school and become doctors and lawyers and, and professors, and the opposite, you know, some terrible, terrible, horrible story about some six-year-old who, in DC, gets stuck in a car in a diaper and dies. But you know, and you're never gonna, you don't hear about the middle. I, I don't know how to affect uh, uh, the, the the folks who are making those uh, television shows and movies, other than lobbying them and, and campaigning with them in any way you know how. But um, do you have any other? Yeah. Well, that, that's, thoughts? well, that's when that's when you do want to call. You know, you don't want to have people holding signs up and say, "Hey, from ten o'clock, we're going to hold up a sign." But frankly, if People organize a group to complain to one of these outlets, and you guys do a lot of the, the life section of USA Today will take note of, of things that all of a sudden Warner Brothers or 21st Century Fox or whatever it's called now is inundated with calls, and groups are, are, are making, are organizing people to make phone calls. That's going to attract the attention of all of us. Mm -hmm. And some of it is even the news media. I mean, Jennifer sent around, uh, in preparation for this, sent around a a sheet of saying these are the correct terms. These are the terms you don't use. There are no no such thing as a handicapped person anymore. I grew up there were handicapped people. They're not handicapped people. They're people with disabilities. The language changes. It's when you the newspaper talks about handicapped people. The call the editor and say, hey, I'd like to come in and talk to you. I represent this group. Uh, this is a demeaning figure. This is a demeaning thing. Uh, this is a much more neutral, fair term. Because people, we people have to be educated. Like the movies, you know, even some of the movies, they don't know. They're not sensitive to it yet. One of the reasons you want diversity, going to be the beaten track. One of the reasons you want diverse newsrooms, you want diverse offices, is so people know. So people know what's offensive. If I'm only talking to people who look like me, a lot of stuff I don't know. That's, I don't know that it's offensive to call certain people by certain names, which are because nobody's told me because they're not there to hear it. They tell me it's different. So that's one of, you know, we talk about getting people in the room, talking to people, make an appointment with your local editors. They sit down and see something in the paper that's offensive to you, and don't attack them. Just say, hey, this is wrong, and this is why. And in fact, it doesn't happen again. Um, so there's a lot. Hang on. Jennifer, you can yeah, yes. do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just was curious, I, as journalists, I know that you're trained to be completely neutral and you know, report the facts, but I was just wondering if ever you feel, um, when you're sitting down to write an article, if you start to feel a plan to the article and perhaps a strategy to the article, especially you, know, you with, uh, with your son and the issues that you might like to advance there. Um, we, I'm at the Department of Labor Office of Disability and Employment Policy, and we're doing some work with Wharton School of Business, and we're learning about mental cueing 
and that a lot of the things that we all typically do in terms of reporting statistics and data uh, is actually possibly causing the opposite effect than what we want, mm -hmm. where our readers uh, or our stakeholders are saying, oh gosh, what can I do about that? You know, like, that sounds too hard, too, too big of a mountain to climb. And that there are, there's always the flip way to present data that, that comes across sounding you know, very uh, insurmountable. And just wondering if, if that ever plays into the way that you, you present the news. <laughs> that was tough. That's the um, best question of the day. Yeah, yeah. best question of the um, so, so, in other words, when data uh, uh, works against you by, you know, like, so for instance, this weekend, let me see if I can analogize this. This weekend, um, this was the AS, the Autism Society's annual conference. Tom Insel from NIMH conference, and he's showing a slideshow, and it says there's 400 million from us, and there's 60 million from this group, and Autism Speaks comes in with 16 million, and here's all these millions of dollars, and here's how it all gets spent. And so he's talking mega, mega, mega uh, research dollars, services dollars, the way it gets spent. And, and, I, and I, I'm a, one person with one son, right? I'm, I'm as if I was in the audience. I'm going to feel like I can't do a heck of a lot about any of that. You know, maybe I can be president of my local chapter of the Autism Society, but how can I possibly affect something at that level? Um, great question. I don't know. <laughs> so, so let me let me expand sure, her question to make yeah, it even harder. So last night we did a focus group with Republican Capitol Hill staffers, okay. and we gave them actual facts about disability unemployment numbers. And we had a fact sheet that was out of one of your government offices, and we added some other stuff. And one of the facts was, in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And here we are 23 years later, and the number, percentage of Americans with disabilities who are working age, who are not in the workforce, is identical. So we've gone you know, 23 years since ADA was passed, and we still have 70% not working. So the reaction to giving that fact is, how does that make you feel? Does that make you want to work on it? They said, yeah, well, maybe we should need to repeal the ADA, because clearly it's a waste of time. It didn't do anything positive because we passed it because we wanted more people to work. So well, their reaction the, was, was repeal it. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> that was the They're message. They were all in their 20s. No, no, they weren't. Um, but uh, they actually weren't. Um, some of them were around then. But uh, so it's like that's a piece of information that just knowing that fact pushed them away from the action that we wanted it to have. But the, you have the answer to it. There's going to be an answer, a response. I don't know what that response is. But maybe with that thing, it's yeah, the same number, but it's a. But, but the raw number is greater right. because we have yeah, a bigger exactly. population. Point out the positive correlating data that mm -hmm. then can, give, can create some traction that the reader says, oh, I think I can build from this. I, I just, just a thought. Well, one of the things I learned at the uh, Autism Society this weekend is that basically everyone in the world has autism in one sense or another. <laughs> they're, all, they're, all, they're all discovering that they're on the Asperger's uh, spectrum. They're all spectrum or, somewhere. Um, yeah. Here. Um, so obviously the numbers are part better, it's just the percentages haven't changed. I mean, I guess I have two responses. One is from the media standpoint, great story, right? I mean, I think that when, when, the, when the numbers are so terrible and not improving and so mega, I don't think it would make the media, especially the major national media, shy away from that. I think quite the opposite. It would, you know, that's the type of thing when presented to, say, a television network should spur a five-part series. I mean, that should be that's huge, um, not news in terms of breaking news, but I mean that's 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 probably one of the, the major issues, if not the top major issue, is employment for people with disabilities. Now, how it makes the staffers feel in terms of affecting that, I don't know. We had at the ASA, they had um, Chris Smith and um, who's the other one? They, they co-chair the autism conference. I think it's um, Holden from um, Pennsylvania, Democrat. Maybe it's not Holden, and I apologize for forgetting. Um, but they had the two House members who co-chair the caucus on autism and have written various pieces of legislation. And 
those guys, you know, immediately would take that kind of information and, and factor it into their bill and then try to get a piece of it piggybacked on another bill, et cetera. At the state level, you're going to have states that are better and worse, and the states that are worse should want to get better when publicized against the states that are better. I mean, playing off, you know, A versus B, make A embarrassed that they're not B. Uh, in Pennsylvania, where we were, they have a state bureau on autism, the only one in the country. Um, so I guess, you know, incrementally, you try to get one uh, bureaucracy or another to react and, and, and improve on the situation. Right there. A couple of comments that, that touch on both this and the earlier question about how you vet research sources. So I'm, I'm the PG head of researcher from Bureau, and you have no idea how excited it makes me that people care about what the research says. Um, a, that's awesome, I'm thrilled to hear that. B, it's our job as researchers to translate what our research means um, so other people can understand it. I'd say maybe half my job in here is conducting research, the other half is making it accessible to advocates, to policymakers, to community members. That's what we do. Um, and so, and even looking at you know funding sources, National Institute of Justice, um, Department of Justice, in every single grant we look at, there is a section that says, how are you going to communicate these findings to the community? So this is, this is on our radar screens, and we're getting better at it. Um, I would recommend definitely looking at the source that come from contacting the authors or the organization. If this doesn't make sense, this is not written in a way that's accessible to you. Um, most researchers care about what they're doing and want people to understand what it is. So please, please talk to us. and. Organizations like Vera, we don't do research that, that doesn't matter. And, and part of our goal is to make it accessible. And you know, if, if we were to report something like, you know, the percentage of folks with disabilities who are unemployed hasn't changed, following up on that, we would say, look at this model program that mm -hmm. leads to increases in employment for folks with disabilities by doing X, Y, and Z. Um, is one way you can address those kinds of challenges. Also, and in fact, I have a big quote here. I was at the Associated Press for a story that came from just the Department of Justice Statistics. Yeah. I don't remember the story, I just remember the name. <laughs> but they're looking for experts in the field. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing of, of, the, of data, you really give us the, today the tools that you can use to, to study data, even giving us the raw data, okay. give us the Labor Department statistics, and even if it shows that, that the number is still 23%, but I get the raw data, I can search maybe. The, some of the states, it's doing really well. Maybe there's a reason why that there's a couple of states that, they, that they've cut the budget, which is why, remember, you get certain states, New York, California, Texas, Florida, the big states, it can skew the data. Maybe it's not so much that it stayed the same, but 40 of the 50 states, it's gotten better. But the, some of it was the 10 big states, because they had a huge fiscal crisis and cut everything, and some of the data would show us to, get, to give us that information, get it to us in, in searchable form, get us to the raw data and access or Excel or any of the other databases. And that's some of the stuff that can help out. And you too, I mean, you're doing the same thing because you're a researcher. Say, hey, wait a second, there's something more. And you've got the relationship to call, hey, you're missing this. There was someone who hadn't asked a question before there. Well, I was just going to kind of add to that. And I wonder if you had given more context around the ADA and, and said some things about one of the points you made that states and the federal government have cut employment services, eliminated training programs. And I know it was a Republican audience, so they might, you know, I don't know how receptive they might have been to that. But just that the whole context, I think employment for people with disabilities is not a simple process. And so it, there are a lot of factors that play into it. And so the ADA is one piece and it's one tool, but it, it doesn't exist by itself. And there are all these other things. and programs that support people with disabilities to work or gain skills to become employed play a big part. And I wonder if that as a follow-up or context in that question might have changed their reaction to what you said. They were very interested in independence and opportunity and self-sufficiency and taking people who are tax money takers into tax payers because they're independent and self-sufficient. So they are very interested in the outcome, um, but um, I mean, even there was a community poll that was done, not by, by us, but by others that was released on Friday. I think most people in the disability community saw it. Um, a lot of the groups were co-sponsored in it. Um, and it showed uh, a lot of interesting data about how it's Democrats and Republicans and independents 
across the board are impacted by disability issues. But the only question that they released was whether or not um, the level of supports for, for, for people with disabilities as a voting issue. And the question didn't ask the outcome of people's ability to, to become independent. The question that was released was, let's measure the success or failure of the disability movement by how much money we can get in dollars for support as t as opposed to let's measure the success or failure of the community by how many people don't need the support uh, to become independent because they had the school or the early intervention or the job coach or the supported employment or you know whatever it was so that they could become um, independent and not on disability payments and so we didn't even we as a community didn't even measure it based on success we we measured it based on dollars going into uh, into benefit payments other question we'll, we'll come to you in a second if, if, are there others back there who want to yeah is we'll it worth our spending time uh, meeting with editorial boards and just helping them to get to know who our organizations are many of us have small organizations we don't have communication specialists so I'm always trying to figure out where is my time best spent. Um, so when you meet with it, well, it depends which editorial boards would be able to, you know, to meet with you, or you could try to meet one on one with a member of an editorial board, with an editor or assistant editor or writer. You know, every editorial board is made with a bunch of writers. Most of their stuff having to do with social issues or disability or whatever. Um, when you do that, you're only influencing that small segment of paper. You know that. You're influencing or you're getting to know the people who are going to write opinion and nothing else. Um, and never the twain shall meet pretty much between the news sections and the, and the editorial board. But, but otherwise, I mean, yes, I would say so. Um, it, especially if you feel that there is a, a pertinent, trendy issue that, I don't mean trendy in a, in a frivolous way, I just mean an issue that's on the bubble, an issue that is important right now. Let's say we're talking a lot about jobs. Let's say it's jobs for people with disabilities, that you know, a rash of statistics are coming out showing the 70% then is still on 70% now, et cetera. You really feel that this is an issue that the board, the editorial board should get on. Sometimes editorial boards jump on issues that their own reporters aren't even bothering with because it's not sexy enough for a news story, but it's important enough for an editorial board. That can apply very frequently to issues like those that you guys are involved with. I've had situations over the years where, I'll go back a few years and talk about a completely different area, but we had an editorial writer at our paper who was an excellent reporter on the environment and probably did more environmental reporting as an editorial writer than any of our environmental writers and would break news and, and set the agenda to some degree on our editorial page in that subject. And so if you find you know, a person, uh, two or three or four different editorial boards who are interested in your subject matter, whether you get a meeting with the entire editorial board or whether you do something on a smaller scale, can pay dividends. Well, I'd also go back to something uh, Richard said earlier, which is the reporter or the editor. Get, make sure you're on their list of sources. Uh, make, make a point with the city editor or the or if you see a or your lifestyle in or whatever department you're interested in. If somebody's written a story on a subject that you're following, you may call, hey, I saw the story. You know, we're working on things like that. I'd love to sit down and meet with you. And you know, sometimes the editorial board does write off the newspaper. So if they, you've got a great story, the editorial board the editor is going to write off, as we reported last week, comma, blah, 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 blah. So that's a, a way to do that. And if you get a small group, you need to get out there. The other thing I wanted to say in terms of meeting, and you know, we were both old school, but I was thinking about that. Uh, Jennifer had a group, I feel which group that came to town last fall that was trying to get a, one of the- Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association came to town and they're trying to get Alzheimer's on the agenda of one people to talk about it during the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. so, well, it's not really a big story for Bloomberg, uh, it's, but we have a political block. It's a great story for the political block, and we did a, a, a nice little story about that. There are blogs all over the place, and it's not the mainstream. The USA Today has a political blog. Uh, other people have blogs, so it may not even be a story in the newspaper. There's stuff now, there's more avenues, either through the mainstream press, who has other avenues, or even blog-only publications, online-only publications. So, so broaden your horizon, 
and think of where things could, could go. Actually, and, and did Rick speak on social media? Oh, yes. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm like the, the, the a Neanderthal on social media, but <laughs> not totally. But you know, I, I don't think I've hit a thousand followers yet. But um, but there's a health writer at our paper. And this is as a for instance, not that you should all scribble her down, but there's a health writer at our paper who I think has 20, 25,000 followers, and she's you know she she tweets probably 20 or 30 times a day. And so you have, you know, your one idea. If she tweeted your one idea, that's going to 25,000 people, all of whom are interested in health and science and stuff like that. So finding your way to those individual people, um, you know, it's no longer, remember when terrorism became, it's no longer about countries anymore, just countries anymore. It's individuals like Osama bin Laden. Well, there are individuals within the media who are, maybe more important in your silo, this woman I'm thinking of in particular, than our newspaper in general, to get to, get to her. And, and one quick thing while I'm thinking of it, I, just before I came over here, I came back to my office from something else, and there were three messages, and I'm listening to the messages, because to some extent, a phone call, a well-placed phone call to the right person with an immediate delivery on what you want could be much better than an email, right? But, I'm entering, uh, I'm answering, uh, not answering, I'm listening to my messages. And the first message, it wasn't from an organization that I needed to hear from on my Supreme Court beat, but it was, hi, I'm so-and-so. My home number is, blah, 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 blah. my email is, blah, blah, blah. Hadn't, hadn't said what her subject was, and I was, click, I just don't have time. So, think, I, no offense, but it's like, if you've got something important, tell me quickly, because I can't listen to all your phone numbers before you even say who you are or why you're calling. So but just be, be, be time efficient. So let me ask you to expand on your answers on that because we're so not on the radar screen that last night when we did the focus group of Hill staffers and we said, well, what disability groups do you meet with? They couldn't come up with a single one. So they immediately went to the disease community and started talking about Susan B. Komen and you know all the people that want to cure as opposed to people who want to help people who already have a disability. So they... they the, we, we, A, the interest groups aren't even on the radar screen on the Hill, but B, I went to, there's a service called, I think it's, uh, anyway, it's, it's you, you spend a bunch of money and you get media lists. And you can put in keywords and you can get how many reporters on that beat. So when I was doing Israel policy, you could put in foreign policy and you'd get everybody who covers foreign policy was huge. You put in disability, the word disability, it comes up with like, 16 bloggers, it's no one at NBC, no one at AP, no one at anywhere, like it's not a beat. Right. So who right. do we, so given that it's not even a beat to look, you know, how do you figure out where to pitch our stories? Some of it will be lobbying, right? You put in lobbying, you're out on Capitol and you have people lobbying on certain issues, it could be a lobbying story. You're raising, you form the pack, a pack to try to raise money to go for candidates, it becomes a political story. So you can get you you broad not just somebody covering disability as a beat. Plus I jump yes. I yes. Thought, for example. Right he's uh, a former what I've a done, former politician. I did years ago, a while back I was a chairman of uh, an, uh, chair, children with adults with attention deficit disorder, a number of years ago in Montgomery County. So I was the uh, the chairman of the of the uh, group. So what I did was I went to three people and I went to the health editor of uh, the Washington Post. There's a circle that comes out, I think it's Tuesday, whatever it is. I went to the uh, Gazette, the County Gazette newspaper, which is divided into different geographic sections, and I went to the one that does my geographic session, as well as the health person, the editor, writer. And then the other one was the Sentinel newspaper, which is also local. And I got them to put stories in, they all advised me to do the same. These are mainly local papers except for the post. Photograph, stick a photograph in. So I got photographs of some of the, uh, the backs of people's heads, but my head, let's say, or somebody who wasn't, you know, didn't care. Didn't have to get permission and all that. And, uh, and after a while, they started calling me to say, hey, I heard that there's a new medication. What do you think? You know, so I would, you know, quickly, figure out what I'm going to think about it and, and get it in there. But it, was, but it was done directly to them. They knew me, I knew them, and it works. And it works all the time. Right. In fact, that's they one, love photographs. Yeah, that's one thing that reminds me of 
if you do get called, I mean, I quoted Vera at the AP because they called my called me back. So if you do get called, because otherwise I'm just going to do it, I'm going to go to the next person. Jennifer at the Israel Project, I, when I'm doing a pro-Israel lobbying story, I always got called back, and they were in the story. So we actually went over time because it was so interesting. <laughs> oh, he's going to Just a couple of things. How, one question is, how might we adjust our approach when dealing with technical news media or specialized news media, such as specialized newsletters, uh, industry uh, uh, press, that kind of thing. So how, how might we uh, alter or tailor our approach uh, to those organizations, uh, to those types of organizations? I'm just not sure where, oh, and there would, had been a question. Would you be as specific too. as possible? Yeah. If it's a group, if it's a group that's doing, if it's a, a health thing, talk about the health issues. If it's a, you know, if it's the construction industry, talk about the need to build ramps for people on, in wheelchairs on crutches. You, you know, stories like that. If it's, if it's a government, if it's focusing on government, the fact that half the time you can't get into the courthouse because the doors are too heavy if you're in a wheelchair to open, even if there is a ramp. Things like that. I did when I was, when I, I started college on crutches because I was in a car accident the summer before. And I tried to navigate the campus. And I couldn't navigate the campus. And the news, my college newspaper, I wrote all the stories. It was a crusader to make the campus accessible. <laughs> because we could have first person thing of trying to get into, I couldn't go to class. Because I had to go up a ramp about you know, half the size of this table. And you can't do it with crutches so easily. So you know, experiences. And just focus on that. Hey, do you know that this is the case? We're people from the, uh, I don't know blind. Are there, is there braille at, at all the buildings? That the government buildings, things like that. That's how you get, and you know, go to the Gazette, go to Montgomery County, and see if you can navigate the buildings. And then when they can't, you call the Gazette. You call them up. So we, we could go on for questions for the next 10 hours with these two distinguished gentlemen. Um, you have been amazing. And I really, really appreciate that you gave us your time. Yeah.